some guys were psyched that I had gotten it out there. And the studio was psyched because it fucking, it was massive. It was a massive announcement. Right. That got all those views. And so it was like, then the guys that were kind of mad about it were like, well, don't feel like you did the right thing here. Like what you did was wrong. It's like, I know what I did was wrong. I'll never do it right. again. They're like, so don't feel like, like justified. I'm like, I know. But then guys are looking at each other, but like, it is pretty fucking sweet. And, and right. like, I definitely did the wrong thing and I would not advise that to anybody. You're listening to Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Janet. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Screenwriters Need to Hear This. I'm Michael Jamman, and this is episode 100 of this podcast. And as an honor, I thought I would bestow this great honor oh. onto the man. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm giving you the honor. It's oh. an honor for you, Lemmy. Onto the man who's kept me employed for the past four years or more. Ladies and gentlemen, hold your, if you're listening to the podcast in your car, please pull over and give a warm round of applause to Mr. Stephen Lemmy. Oh. Lemmy. Oh. Let me, let, me give you, let me tell people who you are, just by the way. This Go is on. the, in case they don't know. So uh, Lemmy, as we call him, is the star and uh, exec creator and executive producer, showrunner of the show I'm currently writing on, Tacoma FD. But you may know him. He's got a long track record of, of indie movies. We're going to talk about how he got these old made, including Super Troopers, Bottle Cruiser, Club Dread, Beer Fest, Lamb and Salmon, uh, a bunch of stuff, including the latest one is Quasi. I'm, I know I'm skipping over your complete filmography, but I want to I want to give you a chance to talk. Lemmy, thank you for being on my show here. I feel like you could just go on forever talking about me. Yeah, that that would be the ideal podcast for you. Just tell me more about me. I would I mean, prefer that. I would prefer no, that. Why is that? Because you're 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 tired of telling your story over and over. Um. No, you know, I don't really get tired uh, speaking about myself, but <laughs> but what I get less tired of is like, um, you know, like uh, I've gone and done some publicity lately. Like, like for instance, I did um, watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen. Okay. Um, do you know what that show is? The no, I didn't know that. Where is that? It's on the Bravo channel. Like, you know, all those shows like- um, All the Band shows you don't watch? Yeah, yeah. I watch them. Okay. I watch them because because um, your wife watches them well that's exactly how a lot of people get sucked into it it's because somebody right. else is watching and you and you walk through the room and you're like what stupid show are you watching <laughs> and like, like, <laughs> like, like i like i i started watching um it was real housewives of new jersey mm -hmm. and i walked through i was like who are these fucking people and my wife was like it's real housewives of new jersey they're just Last week, this chick right here flipped up a table and called this other one a prostitution whore. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> and 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 then they sh actually showed it like on the the TV, like they replayed what happened last week, like in in a flashback. And I was like, w "Wait a second, hold on." And I sat down. Right. And I was like, "Hold on a second, hold on a second." what happened like why would she flip up a table what's wrong with her and, and like she's like well that's the thing like she's kind of on and 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 there was born another fan of these shows and then well, like you try to resist but wait i don't want i want to know the, you gotta answer the question though why why is it you didn't want to talk about yourself in the beginning i asked you is it because you do so much publicity right? i got off track i got right. off track but like um it's not that i don't want to talk about myself because and I, I think it must it must get hard to answer the same thing over and over again. Um, well, sometimes I fascinate myself, Michael, and so uh -huh. I, I find great comfort in hearing myself speak because I'm like, while I'm saying it, I'm like, oh, this is nice. What I'm saying right now is good, and I'm enjoying <laughs> I'm enjoying my own company. I'm a big believer in, you know, actually my way into the arts was my mom saying because because I didn't have a lot of money growing up, and mm -hmm. and actually that's actually. It's mostly true, but it's more that like my mom was a teacher at a really wealthy private school. Right. And so it, whatever, whatever is the reality or not, and I suspect it, it actually is real. I didn't have much money growing up. It felt less to me because know. I was hanging out with people that had, you know, it's like the kind where after Christmas, uh -huh. like, or you go to their house before Christmas and there's like a million presents under the tree. Yeah, that's and right. And you're like, Jesus, like I've got two. And even that's better than than a lot of people. That's why I hesitate to to complain about it and put myself in that right in that place. But I was when I was a kid, I would complain about not having toys, and my mom would hand me paper 
and crayons and pencil and pen and scissors and scotch tape and say, make something. Right. Entertain yourself. And she would say, if you can't have fun with yourself, you'll never be happy. Okay. And so, by the way, am I allowed to be dirty on this podcast? You can say whatever you want to say. I was about to make a masturbation joke, which I know oh. you you <laughs> I was already there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, my my point is um uh-huh. So now that's uh, I'm totally off the well, mark. You, this, you were saying you, this, is, this is your introduction to the arts, right? But so anyway, uh, uh-huh. oh, I was saying I I enjoy spending time with myself, like oh, okay. uh, kind of the arts. But the point is, I went on Andy Cohen, you know, watch what happens live, and this has happened so many times where the intro, the way they introduce you is dog shit, and he he's like um, he didn't mention the movies, he didn't mention Broken Lizard. He just said he's um, on a new TV series on Hulu called Quasi. Thanks which, for getting everything wrong. <laughs> yeah, which was not true either. And, it, right. and I was like, and then it's like, you know, look, like I'm aware that like a lot of there is a younger generation of people who aren't familiar with Broken Lizard or, or those movies or Super Troopers or mm-hmm. Beer Fest or anything like that. But or they haven't watched it, but they. But there are fans there, and also, like a lot of times, if I don't know my mustache, people won't recognize me. And so, but if they say it, if you get a nice intro, yeah. at least it gives you some credibility. But in this case, right. I was like some jackass at the bar. Yes, you know the celebrity bartender. Right. And um, so, anyway, I like a good intro. Like I like to get sure. stroked. Yeah. What, I, did I stroke you enough when I brought you on? You did, you did, but I okay. like I, I could have listened to more. You could have listened to more. The thing about you, and I've said this before, and I'll say it publicly, there are one of the great joys of working with you is that you are an open book when you talk about stories from your past, and you're brutally honest. And the best comedians that I've worked with are, are the same way. Like Mark Maron was the same way. Like he'd say things in the room, you're like, "Whoa, I can't believe you're telling me this," and you're the same way. And it's so it makes it so much easier to write for you because. You know, you're just you're just being vulnerable and you're sharing yourself and, and there's no judgment there. You're just being it's just funny. Thank you for saying that. I I, I I know that about myself. Kevin will say I have no filter. Right. That's that's what he will say. But I'll tell him he's too filtered. Right. You know, I'll say, Kevin, you need to open up a little bit and, and share of yourself. Um, because it because but but it also puts the other writers at ease. Yeah. And yeah. encourages them to tell stories like it's like if I'm willing to tell the story about you know like again it's like a lot of these things tend to wind up being a little bit crass but it's like you know if i'm willing to tell a a disgusting story about myself (laughs) or a story where i embarrass myself horribly or a sex dream you had for example with i've had several (laughs) with with one of your friends (laughs) okay i won't say who that's a great example no so that's a great example right so uh, can you hear the, we're, the noise? We're doing an interview here. <laughs> my wife, my wife has come in with the children, so okay. she, she she doesn't know, and I'm displaced. I right. don't have an office with doors anymore, so I'm in right. the. There was some damage to his house, so he's got to do an impromptu. Yeah, yeah the go, whole go side of the house is flooded. Okay, yeah. so the story is, um, so Michael and I have. A, I'll even say the guy's name. Yeah. Okay. Because it makes it better. Like, uh, <laughs> we have a, a common friend named yeah. Eric Levy. You grew up with him in. Yeah. In Fresh Chester. Yes, in high school, yeah. And he and I went to college together. And um, and I don't even know if, if this is proper or improper to say, but, but I'm not gay and neither has he. But I had a dream about him <laughs> where he showed up at my house with like 50 bags of McDonald's burgers. <laughs> and then it cut to me fucking him in the ass. <laughs> but he was on top of me. i still love this story and then go on and then but i told the story because like whatever we were riffing on it was like what about those like and then i told him about it yes and how did he like i I called up laughing the next morning i was like holy shit this is so (laughs) fucking funny i had this dream about you're never gonna believe it because you know and there's a lot of guys who would be like, well, I'm, I'm taking yeah. that one to the grave. And I, but like, but the additional joke for me is that like, when I have like with Reba McIntyre, mm-hmm. I had a sex dream about her. And to me, when you have a sex dream about somebody, like what's the difference between actually having sex with them? Because if, in real life, if you have sex with somebody afterwards, it's just a memory and it lives longer in your memory. And so to me, it's like, if you have a vivid sex dream about Reba McIntyre, which I did, 
and then it lives on in your memory, it kind of counts. Like, well, but, but there's no, no, because there's no consent. She didn't consent to that. Neither did Levy. <laughs> You're saying I, I'm there a, a non-consensual <laughs> sex dream that you had with both of them. I don't know. I feel like there's a there's a a, a blurry line there. <laughs> but you, this is just a good example. This you told this story probably the first year of Tacoma in the writers' room. I just remember laughing my ass off, thinking, "Oh my God, this guy's going to be game for pretty much everything we pitch." <laughs> yes, it makes absolutely. It easier to write. <laughs> well, and that's why you and I wound up sitting next to each yeah. other because you would always mutter filthy little offerings <laughs> under your breath to me. Uh, and you would enjoy them, yeah. I didn't. Think I enjoyed them quite a bit. I enjoyed them quite a bit. <laughs> Let me ask you that because I have to. I don't know if I ever asked you this, or maybe I forgot. We met you. you the show had just gotten picked up. And we met through the same our manage or we have the same management company, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. I do. used to be with them. I'm not with them oh, anymore. But terrible. Kevin is still with them. And that's how we had that meeting. And did you meet with other writers at our level, or were you, um, did you just laze out and say, "Fuck it, we'll just hire these guys. I don't want to meet any more people." We, I, I, you know, Kevin and I get in trouble like that because we oftentimes do hire the first person we meet. Yeah, which was you. <laughs> um, thank, thank God. Yeah, but I think we did. God, they're really making a racket over there. Um, I did. Okay. Uh, we did meet with one other okay. set of showrunners, I believe. But then, what happens anyway? If Kevin and I get past the first interview and make it to the second one, by the second one, we're all, we're definitely bored, and we realize we've made a mistake by prolonging this process. Uh -huh. um, so that's with us. You know, with us, timing is key. If you get in with us early, like if you ever hear about like. Yeah. A Lemmy Heffernan gig, get your resume to us immediately. Yes. Because you'll, you know, you'll hire the first person you see. <laughs> we, you, you got the job. Yeah. That's you so got, funny. I know you're good that way. What is it like? No, I, I don't I haven't asked you this question, but you do most, you don't do all your projects with Kevin. You do a lot of your projects with him. Or, or is it now? Is it everything? Um, I know I have some side projects. How do you um, decide what you're doing with him and what you're not doing? Well, I try to do um, most things with Kevin, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and I, I think Kevin would agree to this. Like, for whatever reason, I sometimes find that Kevin is a little tougher to drag into things. I believe he will corroborate this. Like, mm -hmm. I, so I had the idea, we, you know, we've, we've kicked around the notion of firefighters for a while, but I mm -hmm. said to him, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And then he said, what's the hook going to be? And I came back with this, you know, rainiest city in the country hook. Because right. it was super troopers, you know, <laughs> most asserted stretch of highway in the country. And even then he like, you know, I had to drag him. And 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 like, I want to be careful with this because I don't want, I don't want to, we developed the show then together and like, and really fleshed it out. So it's like, I don't want to, and, and he has also had many ideas. And in that, in those TV sessions, he also had some ideas that, that he wanted to do, but like, the animation thing now is another one I felt, I feel like it took me a long time to just get him to like really be into it. I and, know it did. <laughs> and I actually, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I think he's only finally into it now, like today. Oh, <laughs> today, today? Or the last few weeks. And, and, okay. we'll, and we'll tell the story. We'll, we'll tell the story, but like now, and again, to be fair, it, it's like I was bringing it up probably like two years ago maybe maybe longer mm -hmm. and he would say like okay sure and then but then we were like you know we'd be writing the series or like then we went into pre-production on quasi which he was directing mm -hmm. but i never just ever got the sense that like he wanted really wanted to do it but do you get the sense that he ever wants to do anything no, no and that's right. my point that's my yeah. point is that is it so like you know and what i realized with kevin and it's and it's fine again it's it's like because we're busy, but sometimes you just have to move the ball forward. And he'll tell me the same thing just in general about things. Mm -hmm. And and I actually think this is true in Hollywood anyway. Like if you want to do something, you just have to move the ball forward mm -hmm. on your own if you can't get interested. Right. And eventually at some point there's like, okay, this is what I've got. Are you, you know what though? Me? When I talk about you, because I talk about you, you guys specifically, when I talk about people who've done inspiring things, because when I describe what you, you Broken Lizard, I describe you as kind of like Hollywood outsiders. There are ways that you can come up the traditional way and the way you guys came up, you just did it. You didn't ask for permission, you did it. And you created a career for yourself and became so valuable 
that Hollywood now wants you as opposed to you begging Hollywood. It's the other way around, you know? I think we're still begging Hollywood. I think with Super Troopers 3 and our relationship with Searchlight has evolved to the point where like the studio has said, we want to work with you. And that's how we got quasi and that's how we got Super Troopers 3. But Super Troopers 2, they were reluctant, but that, that's the way the business works. It's then that movie did well and it's like, and there were new studio heads and it's like, okay, this is a new relationship that's, that's really healthy. I think that um, everything that Kevin has ever gotten and that I have ever gotten, <clears throat> we have gotten for ourselves. And even right. though we have agents, and, and I have I have great agents and, and managers who bring me things now. Are they bringing you what talent? Are they bringing you ideas? What are they bringing you? Um, they like my management and my agency will bring me uh, TV and movie ideas to potentially. From uh, who? Um, so like my management company has, they have a big lit department, like a big book and, and, uh, division. And so like, and so does my agency. Um, mm -hmm. so my management is Gotham group. And then my agency is CAA mm -hmm. and that like every Friday CAA sends me books, like book, uh, the books that are out, the new books. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I've never gone down that road. There was only one book I wanted to, um, buy and then the rights to and then my old manager poo pooed the idea and then i found out that like three months later showtime bought that book and i was like you son of a bitch but wait when uh, they're sending are these are these best sell these are how are they getting the books i don't know anything about it they're getting best sellers these are on the bestseller list these books so so my management company represents authors okay and caa they have a literature like a book literature division in new york city Mm -hmm. that represents writers and or publishers i'm not sure really how it works but i'm just telling you every friday i get a list of these things and, and like um how interesting it it's is so funny because they don't we don't get it you're getting an email list i don't get an email list of books from from uta <laughs> like how hard is it to put me on an email list well and that's the thing it's like and the thing is it's been years now mm -hmm. and i've never even responded to the email and i right. think that i'm on an automated list now yeah which is actually it's nice i should actually look at the the thing but but i, I should look at the list but is you know, it are there pdfs attached or you, you request a book uh you know i'll know. i'll forward it to you uh, on the side yeah okay um You're, i'm just curious how how hollywood works <laughs> well but that, i think it works you know it's so funny because it's like it works so differently in every way in fact like the joke that kevin and i have and i'll finish speaking about kevin and like our like the animation thing but like uh because it's kind of a funny story but kevin and i have always marveled at how hollywood never has a shortage of original ways to screw you over oh, oh yes <laughs> and right now we've we've got another one going which is that we've got this strike going mm -hmm. and kevin and i have a tv show that we can't promote and it's like we worked really hard on it mm -hmm. we worked for over a year on it mm -hmm. we actually got pushed like the release got pushed like six months or five months because that network is in shambles. Right. And then it just, and then three weeks before it's going to come out, they say it's going to come out in July. Mm -hmm. And then the strike happens. Yeah. And it's like, and we, we had been recording podcasts that would be, you know, uh, a company pieces with mm -hmm. the episodes and my, older son acted in last week's episode i couldn't promote mm -hmm. it my younger right. son is acting in this week's episode i can't talk about it right and it's like that's that's actually one of the most heartbreaking parts yeah uh -huh. is that like you know i got to act with my with one son in a scene and it was and where he was playing me as a young boy my character mm -hmm. was a young boy and i was playing his grandfather right and then my other son i got to direct in a scene where he gets to say dirty words uh-huh and I can't talk about it. And that's, I'm like, Jesus, what a screw here. Yeah, that's so fun. I, I, by the way, I know I'm hopping around, but what's it like when, you know, your, your comedy trip, uh, uh, Broken Lizard, you're, when you, what, is it weird to be acting against these same people over and over again and pretending, okay, now today we're pretending to be, you know, one thing, but, and I'm yelling at you, but we're actually friends on the side. And is that weird? Is there, is there a moment when you're acting like, wait a minute, we're best friends. <laughs> <laughs> um no because like like it's funny because kevin and i like first of all with kevin he and i have now done so many um 
so much together and so many emotional scenes together. But we right. like to say it's faux motion. Like we don't deal with emotion. We deal with faux motion as, right. as you know. And so it's like, if you watch Quasi, like he and I have a few big blow up scenes <laughs> with like fake, you know, with like voice cracking. Yeah. And, um, you know, in, in Tacoma, we have plenty of scenes where we yell at each other and, um, you know, sometimes we get emotional with each other. Mm -hmm. And I always, I always think it's funny because it's, it, for us, it's also like we've been friends so long and we're so on each other's nerves all the time <laughs> that like these things are therapy sessions. Cause a lot of the time in the show, we're discussing things that right. bother him about me and me about him. And so like, but like is there ever a moment where you just, we were in the scene, you're supposed to be in character and then suddenly you check, you go, wait a minute. I, Ah, he's just doing his thing and I'm doing my thing and we're both make doing make believe. The only time I ever feel that way is if we start improvising mm -hmm. and he starts like he, like we had one I can't remember what what the episode was, but he said like, oh, I know. It was the episode the chili cook-off where he's like fucked up on dental drugs. Yeah. Come he's had his wisdom teeth removed. And he improvised a line like, oh, you must be, he's like, are we on a roller coaster? Are we on a roller coaster? He's like, oh, hey, hey, Eddie, you have to be this tall to ride this mm -hmm. roller coaster. And I was like, well, and there's a, uh, a a maximum weight limit as well. Right. And I felt bad about that because I was like, it, it didn't matter that he had made a short joke at me first. I felt bad that I had made a fat joke. Right. And that happens periodically. Like I right. throw one out probably like once every three months. So once a quarter, I'll make a, a heavy guy joke. Is it weird though, hanging out with him outside of work though, when you see each other so much? I think I'm good for him. Like the, like the other day, a couple of months ago, I was like, why don't we like, why don't we just go out and hang out? Mm -hmm. And he's, he's like, I see you every day. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, that's exactly why we should hang out. We see each other every day because we are working together, but like, let's go mm -hmm. have some beers and some tacos and have some laughs and not work. And and, Which, and did you do that? Yeah, and it's funny because like, uh, like one of my favorite pastimes is is uh, being right over Kevin. <laughs> I don't mean like in the collaborative sense, but when like, when I'm like, my point of view is, is correct and yours is incorrect, which it was in that case. He, right. he was like, okay, uh -huh. okay, fine. All right, so let's go back to the animation thing. Yeah. So like I was saying, I don't even think he, so, so like with the animation, it's like, it took a while for me to get him, like to, he, would, he would agree in theory, but then it was like, there was never any, like whenever he would talk about upcoming projects, I'd always be like, and we, we should talk about animation one of these days. He'd be like, yeah, okay. And, and I couldn't get him to engage. And then even when I said, finally, like, let's just sit down. Just give me five minutes. I'm going to go through a list of animation ideas and let's discuss them. He said, he said, okay. And so I sent them to him in advance. And, and literally it was like one line. It was like, you know, the uh, lumberjacks. It was, you know, whatever. And, 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 and including the one that we're working on. Yeah. And he said, okay, I like these. And that's fine. That's all I needed. And so then I started to flesh those things out. And then I would show them to him. Now, see, Kevin is a, is a machine. He's a computer. And so if you really want to get his attention, you have, to, you have to show him a piece of paper with something on it. And he puts it in his pile and he makes a list. Okay. And so then a week later, I'll be like, have you had a chance to read the thing? And now, and so what Kevin respects is work. Yeah which a lot of people do. It's like, you know, in a creative process, it's like, don't tell me you don't like a joke if you don't have a replacement right. idea. Or, you know, don't say like, hey, let's work on something and, and bother me about it if it's not real, if you just want me to actually make the first step. And so it's like, if you give him the first step and it's like, hey, I've done this work, he respects that. And so right. he'll, he'll read it. And so then it was funny then because we were, you know, like he was doing, um, he was editing Quasi. And we were in the writer's room for season four. Yeah, you guys are so, busy. And I said, I'm, I'm going to, I'll do all the work on the animation thing. And so it's like, I started to flesh it out. And then I'd send him this pitch document. Here are the characters. And we started to get it together. And 
what we were going to do and the plan was that um during a hiatus we were going to wind up pitching these two producers who had been the president and vice president of true tv and they were the ones who bought tacoma fd and put us on the air mm -hmm. and they'd done everything right you know that thursday night with us and impractical jokers we were winning cable right so like they, and they were beating tbs like their their <laughs> sister company and then AT&T took over and they just got punted. So they did everything right and they got fired. Mm -hmm. um, but we always had a good relationship and they, we always said, hey, we'll work together again. And at some point they, appro they approached me and they said, hey, do you want to do some animated? Because we've got right. something going. And so, um, so the idea then I, I told Kevin was like, we're going to pitch this during the first hiatus. And the hiatus for people who don't know is that like after, we, you know, we shoot in blocks. So we shot the first three episodes in one block and Kevin directed all of them. And we took a week off mm -hmm. to scout locations for the second block and prep. And the, that was the block I was directing. And so that was two more episodes. But in that first week, then we were ready to pitch Chris and Marissa. And so, you know, even the night before the pitch, I kept saying to Kevin, I was like, all right, so tomorrow, you know, we, we are pitching Chris and Marissa. He's like, but it's not like a pitch that was a conversation. I was like, well, it actually is a pitch. He's like, but it's not like a formal pitch, right? We're just talking to them. I'm like, no, we're actually pitching them. I'm pitching them the show, but don't worry, I'll do all the talking. Right. And he said, fine. And so the next day we got on the Zoom with them. I pitched them the show. They seemed to love it. Mm -hmm. And we went our separate ways and they brought it to their studio that they're involved with. And right. three days later, we found out that studio was going to make an offer, right? which they did. And then we negotiated that offer for several months, which I think a lot of people who are not in Hollywood don't realize that like sometimes negotiations can take nine months, sometimes a year. Yeah. In this case, I think it was like a six month thing. And in that period of time, we, we approached you guys, right? brought you guys in. And then we went to our first meeting with them after the deal, like all the deal had been signed and everything. And you remember we were, we were outside. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and Kevin asked me, he, he was like, have we, I asked Kevin. It started because I asked Kevin. <laughs> Kevin yeah. didn't have the answer, so he asked you. <laughs> yeah, and the question was, is it, have, is it, have we sold this? <laughs> have we actually sold this thing? Yeah. And the reason you ask that, and for people who don't know, is most commonly, um, certainly before the streamers and the network time, there was something called an if-come offer. Mm -hmm. And this was, I, I think, the norm for most people who hadn't done anything. Yeah. If I went to... Um, a studio and i said i've got an idea for a tv show they might say hey we love it right we're going to make you an if come offer and what that is is we'll pay you x amount of dollars if yeah a network says they want to do the show yeah right and if not we're not paying you anything right but because we've made you this offer you're with us right and that was the norm and we took that and we would negotiate that we would negotiate a deal that we're not getting paid on yes unless somebody else says yes. And it's called right. an if come offer. Um, right. And so that was the nature of that question. Have we actually sold this thing? It's, are we getting paid? Yeah. And Kevin asked me and I was like, yes, we've sold it. But he put so much doubt into me that it was like, I think we're pitching again. <laughs> so, and so then we went in and sat with our executive producers, uh -huh. the people who had bought it, the producers who had brought us to them and sold it for us. Right. And I, pitched it again but now i was nervous and I, they were, I didn't do a great job pitching. no you did great you did great and they, they loved it but I then think, yeah but then it turns out yes we had sold it we were going to get paid and we were moving forward so then yeah. kevin was very surprised he's like oh i didn't i gave him shit about that yeah and even then he wasn't he wasn't totally on board until we saw the animation what we were writing the script and he was like yes fine it's still abstract uh -huh. But it wasn't until we got into the when they sent us potential sketches and artwork for all the characters and the locations and the scenes and <laughs> settings that he was like, he said to me for the first time, this is really cool. Oh, good. There's a whole other world in Hollywood that we've never been a part of that we're a part of now. I was like, yeah. Yeah. So this, anyway. That's hilarious. Well, how do you, um, sorry, how do you, how would you decide what projects not to do with them then? Oh, you know, so I don't think you have many. You've done some, but why? Why would you not do a project with them? It's like um, it just depends, and and I, and it's funny because there are times where I, I I actually think I've said to him, and I mean this that like, even if I do something separately, 
we'll still produce it with our production company. Like he'll be involved, you know, like, like I have a, a TV script that I've been working on for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. that I, I probably wrote it back in like 2009 and it's very much about the, that, that period, m my high school years when mm -hmm. I was at this elite private school and I was feeling like an outsider, uh, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't an outsider. Like I, I had a great group of friends and I, I was actually, I hate to say it, but I was, I was fairly popular, yeah. but I felt like I didn't belong at this place. I almost felt like an imposter right. and, you know, like we were there not because we were wealthy, which it was the school full of wealthy people, but because my mom had been a teacher there and now she was gone there. And so I didn't have a, they, they had only given me a partial scholarship when I was three, when I first went there. But that's a good idea. That I think that could sell. That's a good idea. Well, and there was more to it, which is that like, I, <clears throat> I also had this uh, job. I, I worked as a back elevator man. Mm -hmm, right. And, it, you know, cause one of my friends, his family was so wealthy. They owned all these buildings in New York city and he, got me a job. I made $10 an hour working as a back elevator man slash janitor. Mm -hmm. Luxury high rise building in New York city that some people from my high school lived in. Right. Um, which was really hard, like to have them see me. Yeah. But like, but more importantly, I worked with these guys down in the basement who were like lifers. Like there was, there was a murderer down there who had fled his oh, wow. the Dominican Republic. He had decapitated a guy and, and he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Um, he, he decapitated a guy after a cockfight, he had a, a, a fighting bird uh -huh. and his, and by the way, he's telling me this story with a thick Dominican accent. He keeps saying, and my cock defeated the other guy's cock. And I'm right. like, oh, you know, yeah. I'm only 15, 15 years old at this point in time. And uh, the guy picked up his dead cock and that, you know, the, the his claws lifeless the, cock. Yeah. His lifeless dead bloody yeah. cock. Flaccid cock. Yeah. And, yeah. and, the the claws and the beak are sharpened on these on these creatures, and this Wait, guy. Did they, did they sharpen them for the fights? Yeah. Wow, that sounds awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just made something bad even worse. <laughs> I know. Well, so then this guy, the loser, <clears throat> picked up his dead, bloody, flaccid, lifeless cock. Yeah. And slapped my coworker across the cheek with it, and the beak cut oh, his wow. cheek. It and my coworker told me this over lunch break. He, he, he was like, I went home and I uh, calmly sharpened my machete and I went to his house and I knocked on the door. He opened the door and I cut his head off. And he said, and that is when I came to America. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So like I was working down there with these guys and the irony was that they would get taxes taken out of their paychecks and I wouldn't because I was a student. Uh -huh. And so I was like actually making more than these guys. Right. Um, but they also thought I was a rich kid because I was friends with the owner of the building and they knew that. Right. And to them, I was like the richest guy in the world and I was going to a prep school. I had my whole future ahead of me. So like, I didn't kind of belong in that world either. It's a little flamingo kid. There was some flamingo kid there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was also a break dancer and uh, a right. professional break dancer. I know as that. You know, and I was not uh, really welcome in that community. Um, right. So, so anyway. I, Why are you sitting on this? You should get that. Well, it was a strike. I, I wouldn't wait much longer on it. Well, so I, I, actually, I, I, I sent the script out back in 2009 and it was incredibly well received. Mm -hmm. um, but this is pre streamers and right. like, you know, I sent it to HBO and Showtime and like I had a meeting with the president of HBO who it, she was like, I love your script. I love your script. And, but I can't do a show about a 14 year old protagonist. And she said, but bring me everything you've got. Like I, you know, and this is at the time. This this is pre pre everything, right? You know, it's, it's pre this new golden age of television. And so yeah. it was like, um, and same at Showtime. Like uh, I had the same conversation. She's like, I, the lady was like, I love it. I absolutely I love it. It was the fourteen year old protagonist. Protagonist. That's such an odd thing because you know, like everybody hates Chris and Wonder Years. There's plenty of shows about. That. But it was R rated. It was R rated. It was an honest yeah. look. At, like because it was okay. also like. You know, part of the pitch was I see all these when you see high school shows about New York City, for instance, mm -hmm. and about a wealthy school, it's like the rich kids are so fucked up. Right. And so evil and so conniving. And that wasn't my experience. Right. And it was also like, or it's incredibly, incredibly clicky with like the fucking 
bully rich kids and like or like the scummy fucking drug using druggies and like it was just i was like that wasn't my experience at all or it's like incredibly angst ridden and, and i was like i feel like there were a lot of incredibly fun experimental times like like yes there were painful times but there were also a lot of incredible times and i never saw like a good mixture of those things right. um anyway so i i have been re uh I, and also the, the funny thing, the honest part was I made masturbation a heavy part of the, the show. Like the All cold right. open, my character is masturbating in the shower. Okay. And the, and his dad's trying to get in. Okay. <laughs> and it's like a freeze frame. He's looking at the at the doorknob. And the whole thing is like that the irony and the hypocrisy of the fact the fact that like in high school your hormones are going a raging and you're uh -huh. all masturbating. Or the, uh -huh. the the boys certainly were. Can't uh -huh. speak to the girls. But no one would talk about it. And so right. like you were like my friends and I would be like, you know, one of my friends would be like, you whack off? I'd be like, fuck no, I don't whack off. I'm not gay. And he's like, <laughs> he's like no, I know. I've never even touched my dick. I've never even touched my dick. Like, How about you? You whack off? I was like, no fucking way do I whack off. And then it's like, but I know you whack off. He's like, fuck you, I don't whack off. And you're like, yeah, you, you whack off. I mean, well, everybody's dying to get home and fucking beat off, you know? <laughs> That was a huge part of the script. Dying I, to get home. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've toned that part down in the script. I am, I'm, I'm actually, I literally am revising it right now. I, I found a, a great thing that I wanted to include in it. Uh -huh. um, a couple of new things. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm writing it. I'm using the strike to write. Well, sure. Well, I'm sure everyone should be, I guess. Yeah. Um, but what about, you guys also do a lot of stand up, which is very different. I don't, do you have a preference to what you wanted, to what you, how you spend your day, days? It, it it makes me sad that I haven't done stand up in five years. Uh, really? What? Well, what's stopping you? Well, now nothing. And mm -hmm. I I was thinking about it today. I'm like, I should I should write a new set. We filmed our Kevin and I filmed our third special mm -hmm. right before we sold Tacoma. Mm -hmm. And when we sold Tacoma, it was when Super Troopers Two was coming out. And so we did a few more live shows to promote Tacoma, but we, um, but then we never had time because then it was like, we were writing the season, like we got renewed for season two. And then it's like, you know, it's so much work. And it, even after like we write and then we go right into shooting. And then after shooting, the hardest part of the show process is the six months of editing. And then it's like, you know, if, really? if, I think that's the best part. Cause you're not on set, you know, it's not as exhausting. Well, well, it's, it's not as physically exhausting. Correct. Yeah. But, and, and I mean, look, now in the days of Zoom, I'm home. I actually, I, I love it, but like, but there's no time to, you know, that's a, that's a, a nine to 6 p.m. or 11 p.m. job, depending mm -hmm. on what day of the week it is and what time of the editing process. And, you know, I'm here with my family. And so it's like, um, and we've been fortunate enough to have four seasons where like, we have a week or two off and then we have to start getting the writer's room together again. Yeah. And so, and this is, I, I'm not complaining about it at all. I'm not, I'm not even grousing. Right. I'm just saying like the one thing, one thing I really enjoyed doing for like 10 years before we got that show was stand up comedy, which you've done. I, yeah, but not a, I mean, I did in college. So uh, I, w I was never at your level, whereas touring and booking rooms well but you do tour with a one-man show and you do yeah that's a little different yeah it's not stand-up yeah it's a little different but it's still performing yeah and getting out there and trying out material like i know if you have if you have a story that's like uh i mean i haven't seen your show you must come but but um what i find <clears throat> about it is so and i was talking about this with taylor swift she's got this three-hour you know concert and when i was performing wait 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 know, Wait, you talked about this with Taylor no, Swift? No, about I was talking with my daughter about Taylor Swift's show. That's a like, big di that's a it's different a big difference. Premise. Yeah, I, I gotta clarify. So Taylor Swift's performing and her show is like like three, <laughs> three and a half hours long. Which and so when I was doing my show, it was an hour and a half long. But at the end of the day, it's at eight o'clock or whatever. The whole day I'm exhausted. I'm because I'm 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 nervous, I'm preparing myself. I'm ex and then at eight o'clock, I'm up. And for the next hour and a half, I'm giving everything. And then you're ex you're freaking exhausted. Then afterwards, you're still on a high, but you're exhausted. And then you got to do it again the next day, where you're like, 
you're wringing your hands all day and you're pacing and then it's, it's exhausting you don't think i do i do um especially like when you do thursday friday saturday and the friday and saturday you're doing two shows in the night and you're traveling and you're traveling and also what kevin and i would do is we would do meet and greets mm -hmm. after every show uh free ones you know not like the ones where you pay extra and you get to come backstage like we would go we tell people we're gonna do a meet and greet out here after the show come by mm -hmm. and say hi and so you're meeting like half of the people that were at the show like oftentimes like that meet and greet would take an hour or more yeah because you found that to be even more exhausting and how than... do you have a time limit with each person you're meeting and greeting no not really i mean it depends on on the club you know like or the theater like uh because the first show there's a natural out because you've got a second show right like, come on folks and then you like bang people through and, that, and the second show that's the one where like people come up and they wanted to like chug right and, uh, that's kind of your brand which is like hey yeah chug and you know we're, we're all we're college bros but you know but um I wonder, like, so what you're thinking and do, because you could do the other way. You could have a mystique, you could put a little bit of separation between you and your audience and not do a meet and greet. You know, like, um, you could. And I'm trying to think if there was ever a time where we came up with a reason or we had a reason not to, but I don't think so. You know, there's something like, we've always had this philosophy of meeting the fans. And Jim Gaffigan once said it. Mm -hmm. uh, he said i'll meet them until i can't meaning and now he can't because he's in he's just too big he's too big it's impossible hey it's michael jammin if you like my videos and you want me to email them to you for free join my watch list every friday i send out my top three videos these are for writers actors creative types you can unsubscribe whenever you want i'm not going to spam you and it's absolutely free just go to michaeljammin.com slash watch list But how long do you, but it's using, is it 30 seconds or are you, are you talking to the guy who doesn't want to talk anymore? How do you know when it's time to move on to the next person? There's, there's, there's a line, right? There's all different kinds of people. There's some people who just want to come and take a picture. There's some people who appreciate that there's a line behind them and you got to keep things moving. There's some people who are going to stay and talk to you until you have them move on. You'll be like, hey, okay, but I hate to do this. Or the club, like, we'll have security guards and they'll be like, all right, let's move it along. Let's go, let's go. We got a lot of people there. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's like something I've, I, I've never really, I don't know. I've always enjoyed meeting people, you know? And like uh, a lot of times, I know a lot of my friends are like, oh God, that person's crazy. Don't talk to them. And I'm like, no, that's the person I want to talk to. Really? Is it really? You're not worried about them forming some kind of parasocial relationship with you and and wanting to get really close to you you know i've never had that happen like uh i mean there's there's a there's absolutely like look i you know like I, i'm a man from the planet earth and i lived here for a long time before any sort of uh recognition you know fan recognition or ce celebrity was happening for me and so it's like i can tell when i'm having a when I'm having a real connection with a person uh -huh. as opposed to like when they're connecting with me and I'm, you know, don't feel it. And, and like, I could certainly, I know when, mostly now because I'm skeptical and paranoid and cynical that like, I just assume like, like, it's like if anybody tries too aggressively to be friends, it's over for them. Oh, really? I see. I don't well, see with you. You're very gracious and you're very social. Way, way more than when may way more than me and so you could spend hours with people uh i feel like even even people you don't like and i've seen you do that i've seen you do that actually well it depends where we are it's it's like um but it's not like if you're at a film festival and some producer is like <laughs> laughing at everything you say you're you're like yeah okay uh, like we're not friends you right. know like it's the you know, it's people that you're just hanging out with. Like we have, it's funny because we have a friend named Champagne Rob <laughs> who we met in Atlanta. And the, the reason he's called Champagne Rob is because he and his, and his girlfriend came to our show and they were sitting in the front row drinking champagne mm -hmm. and we just ragged on them. 
We were like, oh, what you, like, what the fuck is going on here? Drinking champagne at our show? They're like, yeah, man, we're having a good time drinking some champagne. And I was like, we had a great interaction with them. Mm-hmm. And then on the meet and greet line afterwards, they came to the, like either the late Friday show or the late Saturday show. The late Friday, if you really want to be friends with us, the late Friday show is the one that you might, you might, you know, have a crack at it because we don't go out Thursday night and we don't go out Saturday night. Friday night's the one you don't have to wake up for anything in the morning. So we, right. so Friday night's the night we'd go after the late show, we'd go out. And usually with people that we were friends with in our town. And, and so on this particular night though, after that show, probably Friday night then, uh, they were on the line. And I had also, I had a, I had a joke about like, I used to, I was talking about male grooming, like uh, manscaping. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a poll given out to the people in the audience. Like, do you like it groomed or do you like it hairy? And I'm like, it, you know, it's like a stand-up comedy. It's a set routine where like, I know that some women are going to be like, you like it, you know, totally shaved. And you're like, well, what's wrong with a hairy one? And they're like, you get hair in your throat. And then mm-hmm. my thing would be like, how far down are you going on this thing? Mm-hmm. And then I, I, I basically, I'm calling them the, uh, the cookie monster of, of <laughs> you know, like they're, they were the dick gobbler is right. what I, and how they're like, nom, 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 like just eating a shit out of his dick and getting all the way down there. And that was like a routine I was doing. And so Champagne Rob's girlfriend happened to be that girl. Oh. And so then they came up afterwards and they were like, Hey, you know, I'm the dick gobbler. And he's like, I'm Champagne Rob. And we're like, Oh, you know, and like we had a, a good laugh on the line. Uh-huh. And the guy's like, Look, you know, and I had some friends there and they were like from Atlanta and they're like, we don't really know where to go. And, he, and the guy was like, I know a speakeasy that's literally across the street, mm. literally across the street. Come with me. Well, have a great time. He's like, I'm not creepy. Like, I'm like, let's just go. It's going to be awesome. And we're like, all right, fine. Fuck it. And his, and his, um, and we went out to his car, we went outside and the, there was his car and the license plate was Muff Diver. It was the fucking, <laughs> Muff Diver. I'm not, not, but I'm not creepy. I swear. Yeah. But like, and then we went to this speakeasy. Mm-hmm. and had an awesome time and of course we're hanging out with the guy there because he's he gotten us in this place and we're just having drinks and like it was a totally totally normal hang and it was like there was no awkwardness and there was no like i mean it was a lot of times when you meet these people sometimes they they don't then know what to say yeah yeah and they'll just start to ask you about yourself and they'll ask questions like you know how did this happen and how did this happen and that's you're like well you know we can't if we can't get past this stage, we'll never be friends and it doesn't get past that stage. And so it's yeah. like, but this guy's like, yeah, we're hanging out. We're having a great time. And then it's like, you know, whatever. And then like, and, and, and then he, you know, it turns out he was a Dallas, he was a Giants fan, like, like Kevin and, and I am. And he showed us a photo of his toilet that he has at home. Mm-hmm. And in the toilet down at the bottom where the poop hits the bottom of the toilet was a Dallas Cowboys uh, star. <laughs> and we're like, this guy's fucking hysterical. And so anyway, <laughs> And then it turned out he was he was a professional um uh what do you call it? jet skier okay sponsored by hooters all right and, um and so the whole thing just made perfect sense you know it was like to be good we, friends with this guy if yeah. you had let me ask though if you decided you want to go on tour comedy wise tomorrow whatever next week how fast does that happen i mean let's say you already have a set let's say you already have material okay i mean who do you, do you call someone and it happens do you have a booker and it happens yeah, I would call my my at CAA. I have my my stand up agent. Okay. And, um, which is actually how I got into CAA. Like I used to be with CAA, and then I went to UTA. Right. And I I left UTA because I, and it was because I had a meeting with the their stand up agent who you know like I, I mean I left UTA first, and then I I, I went to CAA, and it was the stand up agent was the one who brought me in because at that at that point in time in like 2009 we hadn't done anything or like and so he was the guy who was like oh i think i can make some money for our agency with this fellow and so he he brought me in there um, well, he he just he books the he just he pimps you out to various clubs basically is that how it works I, i'm surprised caa does that like i thought I, I thought there was like a smaller thing that other smaller you know agents did not you know well, no i mean there are but there are agents who are bigger than others yeah you know so it's like like he um represents a lot of big people big yeah um it, big stand-ups you know so you could just get you could just all right literally you made a call this today you, in a week or two you could start you could start touring basically yes wow yeah um but it, you know it depends it's like it, it it also depends on like now it's been five years and you know like 
and we have the show. So the question would be, what kind of places can we book? Mm -hmm. You know, we know we can book the smaller places. Mm -hmm. You know, we can sell those places out. We we always were able to because of the movies that we had made. Right. And so we enjoyed a success there that a lot of stand-up comedians, um, a, a luxury that a lot of stand -up, that most stand-up comedians don't have, because most stand-up comedians certainly back then had to do the club circuit and first they would be doing five minutes and then they're strangers to people. So they have to make people like them, mm -hmm. right. which to me is like 90% of the, of the battle. Once you've already got the fans, you actually, you're, it becomes more, a little bit more like you're giving a wedding toast. Not that, not that you're like fans will accept sub par up comedy. Mm -hmm. but they're more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt and if you fuck up you can just look at them and they'll be like yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're like i know i suck and they're like yeah fuck you and you're like fuck you interesting because that's what jay that's what jay is doing now he's on the road doing stand-up right i mean yeah he's in the uk right now he's uh, like he's actually uh breaking new ground uh and that he's he's going to do a show a couple shows in england wow um which is you know, it's sort of like the logical next step for American stand-ups. You go and do the UK, England, Ireland, Scotland, Australia. But you're not really interested in doing that now. I mean, because first of all, it's hard to get family. It's like, what, you know, how long do you want to be on the road for? Or is that, I mean, is that your, is that your thinking or no? I don't, I only, I mean, I love doing stand-up comedy. I don't love touring. I only liked it because I was with Kevin and I wasn't uh -huh. alone. I, I did a couple of solo dates mm -hmm. and I found it to be very lonely. Yeah, what well, what because the the entire day you're alone. You're alone, and then at night after the show, it's like you know, like if Kevin and I were were sort of wired, we could at least go back to the hotel bar, and have a beer, or we could go to the room, our rooms, one of our rooms, and like, you know, smoke a joint or something like that. Whereas right. like, when you're you're alone, it it's like, you might hang out with the other comedians, just fine. Right. People want to make new friends, or you go out with the staff, or you meet a fan or something, or, you know, like somebody's at the show, I don't know, or you go out by yourself, but like, or you go back to the hotel room, but like you're wired. Yeah. And it's a yeah. really weird thing to like, just get in bed and watch TV or something like that. You yeah. Know? Um, so it's so interesting to be talking about, uh, I don't know, all, all this is so new to me. I don't really, you know, you're the, the life of a performer for you. It's fascinating to me. Well, I think that is, uh, well, it's funny that like the, the, the worst stand-up experience I ever had was I was booked to do a solo weekend in Vermont, in Burlington, Vermont. Okay. And that was lovely. In the fall, it's perfect. It was perfect. And I'll tell you, it was probably, yeah, it was the fall. And what happened was to promote the show, uh -huh. um, I was interviewed by a Vermont free newspaper. Okay. And the, the, the journalist, you know, asked me all these questions. And, and so so Super Troopers 2 had been finished mm -hmm. and the studio said, we're going to wait a year to release it because next year on April 20th, April 20th falls on a Friday. Uh -huh. So we can release the movie on Friday, April 20th on 420. And so we're waiting for that day because that's right. the that's the time to do it. We're like, okay. But they didn't announce the day and they kept being like, they didn't know when they were going to announce it and they kept putting it off kept putting it off they kept saying soon 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 and it was killing everybody right and so i was uh, doing this interview with this free newspaper and the guy said do you know the release date of super troopers 2 i said i do but i can't i can't tell you and he said come on what is it and i was like i honestly can't tell you mm -hmm. and he's like come on please like tell me and i was like i can't tell you i'm not gonna tell you and he said okay and so then we kept doing the interview and then the interview was over and he said, he said, okay, the interview is over. And he said, now as a fan, can you just tell me? Uh, and I said, I can't, I'm not going to, but I'll give you a hint. Oh no. There's a very popular stoner holiday that falls on a Friday next year. Okay. And he said, okay. And he was like, that's awesome. I was like, yeah. So then I was flying the next day to Vermont. And when I landed, there was like messages, like a text message from Heffron, like, you're in trouble. <laughs> you guys are big mouth. What a putz. What and, a then, putz. and then the guy had 
and even kind of made fun of me. He's he's like, he wouldn't tell me the release date, but I pushed him and pushed him, and finally he told me it's four twenty. Right. And and so that and like Jay was pissed off, and my producer was pissed off. Uh -huh. Studio was fucking furious. Yeah. Because they wanted to announce it, make, make it splash, but they had all the materials; they just weren't doing it. Right. And so they were like, the, it was still this little teeny newspaper a free newspaper and it was like yeah, and, you, and you gave them the scoop this free fucking yeah. <laughs> vermont maple syrup you get in like a pizzeria you just fucking yeah <laughs> don't you throw away you wipe the table with <laughs> yeah but so you get the scoop i was really fucking this is thursday i did a show that night uh -huh. and i was like fucking devastated so i went out there and did a, a half-hearted show uh -huh. like my heart was heavy and then and it was wait and see if anybody picks us up. And then Friday morning, it got fucking picked up and was everywhere. Right. And so, and and meanwhile, there were email threads with all the studio, the president of the studio. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like, and a hundred people from Searchlight. And then all the Broken Lizard, not me. And even like my producer, like, I was like, dude, I'm suffering over here. Like, you know, you gotta like, tell me what's going on he just wrote back suffer like he he was fucking pissed off oh wow and yeah now it hurt and i was like i like went jogging that day and like and then they released it that day uh -huh. they did the official release of the trailer and the date and it got like eight million views in the first fucking 24 hours alone okay and but nobody's talking to me that that whole weekend. I didn't know any of that, but like I knew it was out there. But like I knew I had rushed the process. But they had, like I said, they had it, and, and they just wanted to punish you. But then the next week there was a meeting at mm -hmm. Searchlight on like Wednesday. Uh huh. To now game plan, and it was like the big question was. So that weekend fucking sucked. I, like I, yeah. I did press on Friday morning and and. I did two shows on Friday night and Saturday night. And like, I had friends coming to the shows and I was like, I was so sad. I was sad, Steve. Yeah. And and I was alone. I did like, you know, and the one guy who was kind of forgiving, who was actually totally forgiving was Kevin. And, uh -huh. and I like, I'll say Paul, like Soder, who you, you, yeah. you work on, on Tacoma, like those guys were, you know, not so secretly. They were like, you know what? I'm fucking glad you did it because now it's out there finally, uh, right? And like, and they were psyched because now we could fucking finally fucking talk about it because we were getting asked about it all the time. So those guys were were cool about it. Uh, the other guys weren't as weren't as happy with me. Um, and then the big question was, was I going to go to that studio meeting? And I fucking went. I was like, I'm going to take my like, I'm going to take my poison. Uh huh. Let's did go. You, and I, did they give you shit there? I went in and I made it. Uh, the the saving grace was that the trailer got eight million views in the first twenty four hours, and it was like holy shit, it exceeded, it far exceeded, right? Uh, and was now like on pace at that moment in time. It was like, oh, that that actually might have been the actual trailer. This this was just like the the like a teaser and the announcement, mm -hmm. um, and it was huge, and so they were happy about that. That's wow. the only thing that saved me because like a couple of them, like you know, the head of marketing and like the president were like. <laughs> Like not that fucking psyched with me. It's so interesting because usually they try to keep. You're the star of this movie. Usually they, they try to keep that. They, they try to hide their disdain for act from actors. <laughs> they, they don't. They don't say it in front of their face. You know. It was a big deal, it, and it caused massive uh, shockwaves that and and a shit storm that then people had to fucking deal with. Uh -huh. While I sat there telling jokes in Vermont. Yeah, funny. Um, That's always the worst when you're. Yeah, you have to wait through something. You just like, yeah, that's I know, I know that feeling. I've, I've been there before. Yeah. I was sick. I was sick about yeah, it. Yeah, sick. And yeah, exactly. And yeah. mad at myself. Yeah. How could I be so stupid? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, the whole thing. Did and you then, did you confront that guy and say, hey, what? You're a dick. No, because I wanted to fucking die. I wanted I wanted uh, the whole thing to die. And so like, yeah. But you know, the funny thing was is that then the next internal broken lizard conversation was that because some guys were psyched that I had gotten it out there and the studio was psyched because it fucking, it was massive. It was a massive announcement. Right. They got all those views. And so it was like, then the guys that were kind of mad about it were like, well, don't feel like you did the right thing here. Like what you did was wrong. It's like, I know what I did was wrong. I'll never do it right. again. 
they're like, so I don't feel like, like justified. I'm like, I know, but then guys are looking at each other, but like, it is pretty fucking sweet. And, and right. but like, I definitely did the wrong thing and I would not advise that to anybody. Right. Well, that's, what, that's so it was an accident. It was an accident. Happy accident. It was a stupid mistake. I have to, before, I ha this is, I'm, this whole thing is, that's what I love about you. You're, you're just this open book and you tell, I, I, I feel like I get an education at the Hollywood from what you guys do. But tell me this though. Yeah. As, as we, as we, uh, I, I've taken a, you know, an hour of your time and you've been very gracious, but as you're now that you're a showrunner for four seasons now and you're, you obviously do a lot of hiring. I got a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are sparring writers. What do you look for in a script? What do you look for in a, in a new writer? All that stuff. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question for, for right now, because, you know, like over the last, in, in, in when we started with um, Tacoma, it was really kind of like at the beginning, uh, maybe it wasn't the beginning, but for me as, as a showrunner, when we were putting together the writer's room, diversity was the first and most important thing that we were being told okay that we had to from the studio yeah. the network in the studio to incorporate into the the writer's room and it was you know it, it was women people of color ev across the board everything like right we you need to do this um which was fine what i found was that then it used to be that i could um like when we, you know, we had a production deal at Warner Brothers for for many years, and it's like you'd re receive these movie scripts that were like R-rated comedies, and you were looking at, you know, because that's what we were doing. So it was, and we were going to be producing for other people. So it was like you just get every R-rated comedy sent your way. And so now, because of the diversity thing, we were receiving all kinds of scripts from all kinds of writers from all kinds of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like I couldn't. You'd you'd receive a script from a Korean American woman, girl, young lady, mm -hmm. um, of you know either whatever her sexuality was, and that experience would be reflected in the script, right? Which is not something I could relate to. Mm -hmm. So what I began to look for was the jokes mm -hmm. inside the script. Where before I didn't really like I could tell jokes and stuff, but I was just like the whole thing. Do I like the whole? idea and stuff it, it, in terms of the scripts i started being sent they weren't ideas that i could particularly relate to unless it was like okay you're the son of an immigrant who's going to a private school where they are right. out of their element you know like okay that i can relate to but it was like in in any script i started to look for what's the type of joke they're telling like is it like a more highbrow joke is it are there a bunch of like some dumb jokes is it like wordplay like what's the right. type of humor here like is it and so that's what i started to to look for in terms of the writing material mm -hmm. and then i found when i focused on that it did, actually the the plot of the script didn't matter at all okay it was like can they tell a story and are the jokes that they're setting up and paying off the type of jokes that I think will work for our show. Right. The type of jokes I will like, because like, like it or not, everybody's got a style of humor. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, if you're, if you're not telling the kind of jokes that I like to tell, it's right. like, I'm just it's not, not going to be funny and I can't hire you. Right. Because in the writer's room, everything you're saying, I'm, I'm going to be like, it's, it's dead air between us. Cause I don't know, right. we're not on the same page. So it's like, but so I started to realize I could just look for the type of sense of humor and then nothing else really mattered. Um, so I, I looked for the type of jokes. I like to know that they can tell a story from, you know, beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is bring the person in, like at, you find those scripts that you like, and then now we're going to do the the zoom meeting. And right. I'll tell you what, if you're the first person I meet, you got the job. Got the job. <laughs> yeah. No, but in and, this case, and we start as we proceeded through each season, you start to realize that you actually do have to, you do want to meet everybody. Yeah. Um, but then it becomes like a personality thing. Can we yeah. riff with each other? Yeah. And again, it's like, it's, you know, it's not so much where you're from or, or who you are, what you represent. It's, can you and I have a conversation 
and have a funny conversation. Yeah. And that's what we look for too, because as you know, it's like we're 17 weeks in a writer's room together. And, you know, the first few seasons we were in the room and then, you know, the last couple of seasons we've been on zoom, but like, you know, in collaboration, sometimes there are disagreements and it's like, yeah. you know, we have to like each other. We have to live with each other for 17 weeks. And, yeah. you know, I have to read your material and you have to accept my criticisms and, and uh, ideas and you have to like my ideas. Right. Cause the truth is like, if, we're disagreeing if, if if we're having a disagreement on something i know who's going to win the argument yeah I, I yeah yeah people don't real people don't realize that yeah uh, young writers often don't realize that the the winner of the argument has already been decided <laughs> right <laughs> and, and that person sitting at the end of the table <laughs> right so i want to hear why you i, I want to hear you defend your idea mm -hmm. but what i don't want uh, number one, what I don't want is for you to interrupt me mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. What I don't want is for you to get <laughs> mad if I'm not taking your idea. Cause it's also like, it's my show. Like, yeah. Forget that it's my show. I'm the one whose responsibility is if, if my joke sucks, that's my fucking problem. Right. Not yours. Right. right. Like right. nobody's going to say, say like, wait a second, that joke sucks. Let me see who wrote this episode. Oh, yeah. it's that person. I'm not going to hire them. Like that doesn't work that way. So it's like, you know, uh, you know, so personality is important. Right. For and, sure, you know. But uh, you know, and that's it. It's uh, and, you know, because for us, it's also like we we want to grow the family, and we've always wanted to grow the family since. What does that mean? It means like since we made Puddle Cruiser, our first movie that we made before Super Troopers, mm -hmm. we have people you know that right. worked on that crew, and if you do a good job and you're cool, you're getting the job the next time. Right. Yeah. And we're gonna also you know it's like certainly you know getting our start in the movies we would you know we were always on location so we'd hang out afterwards and socialize right, right. and that's important and you're having laughs and then it's like i fucking i love you i love you too like right and then you're hanging out socially outside of work and then it's like right. we're, we're we're friends and it's and it's like because i actually believe that like if you think about you know if i think about my best friends it's my friends from high school mm -hmm. i went to two high schools so it's my friends from both those high schools and then it's my friends from college and then my friends from waiting tables. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, it's the people that I've, it, it's the people that you, I think friendships are made when you have to hang out with people because mm -hmm. left to my own devices, I'm not fucking hanging out with anybody. Like yeah, I, I right. just want to with my family, but like, if I have to hang out, let you, like, if you call me up or like, let's go get a beer, like I'm in. Right. You're in. You problem is you live too far away. That's the problem is you live too far away. No, I think honestly, you live far away. You both live very far away. Yeah, so do I mean, you. Let's not say we're no, we're closer to Hollywood than than you are. You're not. You're closer to <laughs> like Oxnard. <laughs> I know. I know. We're so far out. We're so if far Hollywood out. were an Oxnard, uh, then yeah, you then I would live far. You live. I, far. I accept it. I accept okay. it. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you know, it's like with our like with our Tacoma family. Like that's why I say it's like if if you're cool and you know you can get the job done then the relationship will just continue and then when the relationship continues then people become friends and the family grows and then it's like as you know it's like you know we had this we sold this show and then we were like well we want some guys to be the showrunners who've worked in animation and i'm like we got the guys yeah it's funny when i tell that story <laughs> and you guys hey you want to do this project i remember saying yeah, absolutely. And then you're like, do you want to hear the idea? Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I just like working with you guys. Doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, and that's what it was. Sure. I like working with you. It's fun. <laughs> well, we, you know, we do have a good time. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because like, I, I'm always like, I don't even remember like the, those first two seasons where we were in the writer's room together. Mm -hmm. I would always come skulking because you guys were like, you know, we had never done yeah. tv before or showrunner so they were like you do have to the, your first hires have to be people with showrunning experience because you need to be mentored yeah and so that was you guys and so like i would always come pretty frequently i feel like i came skulking around your offices after the oh, the writer's really. day had finished okay. yeah. you actually were usually out the door 
Oh, that was, I was going. That's the first rule that you never learn. When the boss says you're free, you fucking run. You run because then they'll come in with more work. <laughs> you're already at the elevator. I'm at the. I'm in the car. Yeah. So you were always gone, <laughs> but like I would come back and talk to Sievert a lot. Yeah. And like I would give him more work, but I'd be I'd be like, what do you think about this? Uh-huh. You know, and and pick his brain because sometimes it's like. You know, you and, and you know, I felt it with you guys like before, like my the favorite one that Kevin and I sort of talk about is like the pickleball episode. Right. That you guys were like, you guys came with like a pretty out there idea, which was, was it our idea. I thought it was your idea, pickleball. No, no, no. The pickleball was was our idea, but yeah. you guys pitched and, and we outlined it. Right. But you guys came back and pitched doing it like a 30 for 30. Oh, right. Yeah. And doing like okay. an alternative take on it where yeah. it was told like, you know, in the frozen tundra, you know, like that kind of thing. Right. Right. And I was the one who, who poo pooed that mm-hmm. and, and was like, I think we should just tell a straight story. Mm-hmm. Like it made me nervous and I just wanted to kind of stick to the guns. And I even remember like Soda was like, <gasps> cause like people really liked that original fresh take on it. But yeah, I was, I was scared of it. I liked it too, but I, w- I was scared of it. And I always felt bad when I would like shoot down somebody's wow. a big idea. Well, see, that's and and, and yeah. see, it's like, nah, fuck that. Who cares? We, we're here to, you know, do yeah. year. We, we don't fucking care. Like, yeah. he, Siebert made it very clear. You guys don't fucking care. Well, it's not that we don't care. It's not, it's not a fight. We're on a fight. We're here to help you make your show. That's it. Right. Right. Yeah. Which goes back to the, you know, the, the young writers. And we've had some young writers in the room that you've been uh, near by and yeah they they can be difficult you know because yeah. they're fight they're arguing with you and and we're nice showrunners like you are you for sure. showrunners who would fucking fire them or yes. bite their head off at the very least yes yes yeah people don't i mean i, I and I, I say that to you all the time it's you saw the show it's your vision we're here to help you make your vision that's it you know it doesn't it doesn't make like i'm right or you're wrong it doesn't it's your sure show that's it so yeah. this is, you know, and, and who's to say that my version is better? I don't know. It's just the version I, I think it's better. It doesn't mean anyone else thinks it's better. So. Yeah. Well, nobody really knows. And that's, I remember like seeing this thing. What was it like, was it talking, talking funny? It was it like Seinfeld and Chris Rock? Oh, yeah. And um, like I'm doing my concentration phase. And uh, Ricky Gervais, I'm blanking on the fourth, but like, Seinfeld was like, um, yeah, it's crazy I, when you was it Louis C.K. It might have been Louis C.K. Um, yeah, but like, like the, the biggest, right? It was and, and yeah. was, was it Dave Chappelle or was he not in that? I wasn't Chappelle. I wasn't Chappelle. Okay. Um, but they, but Seinfeld was like, you know, I go into these network meetings and he's like, let me tell you about something about stand-up comedy. Like, if you do stand-up comedy, you don't know if something is you might think something is hysterical, but I'll tell you what, the audience is actually going to let you know if it's funny. Yeah. And so the audience is half of it. And and I think every comedian has that story of like the joke that they thought was awesome. And they went out there and delivered it and it bombed. Mm -hmm. And like, well, it's not funny. Right. Or the way I did it isn't funny. And maybe I can try to improve on it. And then it's still not funny, but it's like for then the executives to be like, we don't like this joke. We want you to do this is absurd. Cause it's like, well, I'm the technically the funny one. Yeah. And what you don't realize is that you can't, you can't tell me something is funny, right? Because nobody knows if something's funny, so you might as well trust me, right? And so it's the same way with running a show. It's like I'm, I'm, I could be wrong, and in fact, there's a very good chance that I'm wrong, but it doesn't matter in this case. But I'll say, as showrunners, show runners, you guys are very prepared. You came, you come with your ideas, and it was, it was a pleasure. I mean, honestly, those four years, I, my complaint was more. I want to do more. That's my only complaint. You know? Right, yeah. but that's a. I think that's a. That's an interesting thing too. Is that like, we learned that our way of doing things was actually not the norm. Yeah, it still wasn't. Yeah, because even in the end, you still you took. I'd say ninety percent of our advice, and the other ten percent did it your way, which is fine. You know. Yeah, but I, it's like like I always found it interesting. Like you would, we try to do it like that way that you talked about. Um some of those shows where it's like you have the the rewrite on the screen and the board on the the screen screen. yeah and everybody's going through the script line by line and pitching things and you know it's like to me and to kevin it was like it was like that's 
an incredibly slow way of doing things. Well, it's only so far as you you decide this line doesn't work for me. That's all pitch on this line. Right. So you decide what is working and what isn't working. Right. And I, then I, I, sec I second guess you. And I go, no, no, you're wrong. Right. And, and then and it all I'm, falls apart. <laughs> yeah, and then it's over. <laughs> but I also wonder if that's because, like, we didn't have the luxury of time ever. Yeah, right. There's definitely and, that. And part of that is because we're acting in the show. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, if, like, I think what a lot of people don't realize is like like so network television half hour shows are what 23 episodes yeah and those are showrunners and writers that are just tucked away writing a show yeah and that writing is often going on while filming is happening and yeah. the season scripts aren't even finished yeah right whereas with us we're acting in the show yeah so and we have to have total control over the script so like mm -hmm. we have to be finished with the scripts before we start and directing exhausting I, exactly. I when i visit on set i'm exhausted for, for all you guys here acting and memorizing and then directing jesus i get tired I, my least favorite part is is directing myself as an actor or, it's the only or, it's the only thing i don't like about directing is acting at the same time oh but you you don't mind directing if you're not in the scene oh i i enjoy it okay. if i don't have to act at all mm -hmm. then it's it's pretty enjoyable to like sit back and like because then Even you can in direct really because it's, it's just a prep and making sure you got the right cameras and the coverage i don't know it's very stressful yeah but that's but that's time but then it's like like you know as as one of the lead characters in the show it's like i have to go home and i have to learn lines yeah you actually have to know your lines better because a lot of the other actors don't know their lines very well and so yeah. and they're learning while we're rehearsing right and it's just that's just an actor survival thing. You're you're doing you know eight pages of dialogue a day. There's no it's it's hard to memorize that all you know each day. Think, yeah, it's very hard. It's very you, hard. But when you're saying it and, and 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 you're up on your feet with the other actors, then it's like it's actually becomes really easy to remember. Uh -huh. um, and then you're getting so many whacks at it. But like, you know, after a day of shooting, to go home and then sit down and study your lines is is exhausting. And yeah, as a director, you have to do that more. Yeah. Because you don't have time to rehearse. You just have the to whole know. thing. You guys are hard working. You really are. You're hard working guys. A hard job. Yeah. And if people don't realize it, it's very hard. But it's a fun job. And it, it's the it's the people around you that make it fun. You might be right. What did, what advice do you have before we sign off that for aspiring actors or writers today, this year? I don't know. As opposed to like ten years ago. Well, it's the same as it was. 10 years ago, it's don't stop. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can, uh, I, I think it can be depressing sometimes to hear, but if you look at, you know, Kevin and me, like, like I said early on, it's like, no one has ever handed us anything. Yeah, right. Everything we've ever gotten, we've gotten for ourselves, even, mm -hmm. even now, you know, it's like our TV show is probably going to be canceled. Mm -hmm. And, and not because we did anything wrong. We, we've actually crushed it and had great ratings, but the, the network, network is gone. Is going away. Like they're yeah. actually trying to kill yeah. the networks. And so yeah. it's like, uh, which makes no sense, but it's happening because everyone thinks streaming is where it's at. Um, no one wants free TV apparently. So like, uh, and they have 90 million viewers, but they want them all to go someplace else. And yeah. so it's like, you t take that as, as, you know the example of how the industry works and it is you're it's you against them mm -hmm. and you're gonna have to prove yourself and but also none of the work goes to waste like even if you write a script and it sucks you're learning how to write right even if you write a script and it doesn't sell there might be some jokes in there that you can use for something else mm -hmm. or like if you look at quasi like we wrote that script 20 years ago right didn't know when it would ever get made and 20 years later, we got it made. Right. It, like the, the work is never wasted. You know, like something about writing and acting and directing is that you're always learning. Yes. I haven't stopped learning my craft yeah. since I started it. Um, and also, you know, the other piece of advice that I've given over the last 10 years is you, you should also, besides just sticking with it, you should actually make stuff because yeah. that's essentially what we did. We were independent filmmakers and we just, raised money and made it and now that's more than the, more easy than it ever was that's easier is, than it ever was is it well We're raising money because the internet well but no but you can i mean sure you could but it's like 
you used to pay for a camera. Now you have, a, you have cell phones and you have, right. you have cheap phones and you used to, you know, film used to be the most expensive thing there was. Now you can shoot on, on digital video. And it's like, yeah. we don't even call cut anymore, you know? And like, um, and you can, and editing, you know, it's like you, you can edit on your computer and, and, and you can market, you right. know, you can market like on Instagram and, and TikTok, put little clips of your thing. And people like it, just download the whole thing. You know, it's like, yeah. Just make stuff, make stuff. Excellent yeah. advice. Steve Lemmy, thank you for joining me here on episode 100. My you're, pleasure. You're a great guest, I got to say. Thank Way you. better than I thought you would turn out to be. I, I know. I'm, you got me to say stuff. I don't know how you did it. I didn't get you to cry. I usually try to get people to cry. Uh, <laughs> you try. You try. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, everyone. Uh, another great episode. I thought for more, you know, keep following me and, uh, you know, that's it. Keep listening. Thanks so much. Keep writing. This has been an episode of Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jammin and Phil Hudson. If you're interested in learning more about writing, make sure you register for Michael's monthly webinar at michaeljammin.com slash webinar. If you found this podcast helpful, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. For free screenwriting tips, follow Michael Jammin on social media at Michael Jammin Writer. You can follow Phil Hudson on social media at Phil A. Hudson. This podcast was produced by Phil Hudson. It was edited by Dallas Crane. Music by Ken Joseph. Until next time, keep writing.